start. So, uh, uh, so I've been at UCSF. I was at Stanford for 10 years and been at UCSF for about uh, 11 months now uh, to help direct the center. I'll talk about what we're doing in the center and uh, kind of the data assets and things. But first, I'll just talk about what I've been doing really for the past uh, couple of years. Uh, first, I always start with my uh, conflicts of interest. Just a few. I mean, uh, I, I clearly have a bunch here. So, uh, in fact, let me get my screen here. So let me get this stick out. <laughs> Laser pointers don't work. Yeah, on, right? I know. I think we have There we go. I have one here. So, um, so I should say I started a bunch of companies. I consult for a bunch of companies. Probably don't want to believe another word I say in the next hour. I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> but most part of the bottom right, those are all the companies started by my students. More than half my graduate students start companies, even if they go into academia. And uh, there's no reason not to. It's not taboo to talk about companies. And they do this with the most amazing platform in the world. It's data. And it's often big data, it's often open big data. So I'm going to show you how they do it, I'm going to show you how I do it. And to me, it's absolutely not taboo to talk about companies. If, in my lab, we do believe if you want to change the world, you can't just keep writing papers about it, right? You actually, actually have to invent something or discover something. If no one else takes that on, you have to start a company to get it to people. That's just what we do. So that's why it's just kind of a culture in my lab to start companies. So a lot of people use this as a slide of shame. For me, this is my slide of significance. This is how I'm actually getting past just writing papers. If you haven't heard, we're in the middle of this data deluge. So the Economist magazine three years ago had a special cover. This guy collecting ones and zeros with the umbrella. And it was this issue where they announced that the human species now generates two zettabytes of data every year. Two zettabytes. So if you forget your metric prefixes, it goes kilo, mega, giga, tera, petabyte, exabyte, zettabytes. And next year, obviously the following year, it's four zettabytes of data, then eight zettabytes of data, because it's doubling every year or two. I mean, first to admit, most of those zettabytes of data are these YouTube videos, right, of kittens <laughs> playing with pianos and stuff, you know, entertainment value. But there's actually scientific data in the zettabytes too. So the Large Hadron Collider in Europe uh, generated petabytes of, of molecular data to figure out subatomic particles, right, smashing atoms against each other. The more interesting example is uh, NASA. So NASA announced about two years ago by the end of this decade, they'll have so many telescopes taking pictures of the sky that they'll probably be generating an exabyte of data every day, okay, every day, just in terms of pictures. Now, already, though, NASA's got this problem. They already admit that they already take so many pictures of the sky that there are not enough scientists on the planet to look at all the pictures. There are not enough astronomers, okay? So what do they do? They get their friends on the Internet to help. They crowdsource it. So you can sign up at Galaxy Zoo. You can take a test, and you can assign it. This is the star. This is the galaxy. But the idea here is we're already entering this world where in some scientific fields we have enough scientific data that there are not enough scientists to look at all this data. So you get other people, citizen scientists, you crowdsource to get more discoveries on that same data set. Now, actually, I think, uh, so this took it even further. This was a Wired magazine in 2008. The editor-in-chief wrote this article, which was kind of inspirational to me. He said, you know, we already have so much data that science itself is getting obsolete. Okay? Now, how do you say science is going obsolete? That's ridiculous, right? It's actually a scientific method. So a scientific method, everyone's taught in fourth grade, you ask a question, right? You come up with a hypothesis, then you go gather data to answer that question, right? And test the hypothesis. But we are in this mode now that we already have all the data, okay? Tons of data. The new magic, the new hard part, if you ask people in my lab, what's the hard part? 99% of the hard part is figure out what's the question you want to ask now, okay? What's the killer question that no, everyone's wanted to know the answer to for like years and years, and no one's realized you can ask and answer that question today with the data you already have, right? That's the magic. That's the hard part. You, because writing the code and statistics and everything is not hard anymore, okay? It's all doable. Figuring out what's the thing to do with all this data is the hard part here. Obviously, in my world, I got my start in the molecular world, and uh, we have our data deluge because of these kinds of molecular tests. Now, on the left, there's a kind of what's called a gene chip. I got my start with about 60 or 70 of these chips almost 17 years ago. And now we've got this kind of mode where we can take any sample of DNA from the blood and get a DNA readout or you get cancer, you can get diabetes, you can get animal models, and you get a readout of all the genes in the genome, okay? Now, it looks amazing, this kind of chip. It looks like a computer chip. Uh, Affymetrix is just in Santa Clara, so it's kind of close to Intel. So they kind of designed it to look like a computer chip. In fact, now they're so cheap, I carry one in each suit, right? So this is what they actually look like. So big data comes from these small packages. Now, in fact, uh, we've had these now for more than 15 years, right? As cool as this is, this, everyone uses these. It's not even a big deal anymore. In fact, though, when we get tired of measuring them one by one, we now have a 96-well plate. 
that's so cheap I can carry that in my bag. And actually now, when we get tired of measuring 96 at a time, we have a 384 well plate. And we, yeah, that's cheap enough, I carry that in my bag. And I cannot more clearly illustrate exponential growth in biomedical data than to show you these plates. And we start, my career started with one of these, and now we went to this, and now we went to this, and we don't even use this one anymore, right? We have RNA-seq, we have all sorts of other molecular measures. I'm showing you these kinds of chips because they look cool, but by, I, I don't just mean these chips. I mean sequencers, mass specs, proteomics. I mean, you know these kind of technologies. Different people know different kinds. I'm just using this as an example that we measure a ton of things on our patients now, right? Including the molecular side. Let's get started. Now, what's really amazing uh, is that everyone started writing these papers with these lists of genes. So here's a bunch of genes that change in cancer. Here's a bunch of genes that change in heart failure. Just here's a list, there's a list. And what happened in early 2000, 2001, 2002, the journals, the top two journals were overwhelmed with these kinds of papers, okay? And they said, you know what? All these micro all these chip papers, no more papers with these chips, okay? No more. Unless you put this data into an international repository, where other people can double check the math, and then maybe others can use this, these samples for something else. So in the molecular world, we kind of have this culture that if enough people use a kind of research technology, you have to share that data, okay? Just think about that for a second. It goes back to something called GenBank. GenBank is right next door neighbor to PubMed. It's one of those tabs up there, right? So GenBank is like 40 years old. The very first paper came out with a DNA sequence. People said, I don't want to type that in again, right? So they were sending tapes to each other way before disks and CD-ROMs way older than the World Wide Web, right? But the culture is there to share the data. Fast forward to uh, August of 2012. Where is it there? August of 2012, this article came out in Nature, featured my lab and others. In August of 2012, we hit this milestone of a million of these chips publicly available, okay? A million samples, 85% of them human. Some cancer, some diabetes, some biopsy, already run on a chip, already digitized, publicly available, totally open to the public, these samples. And if you look really carefully here, you know, this is growth. I started the career like down here, zero to a million, right? If you look carefully, it kind of looks like it's slowing down. I don't know, can you see the slope there a little bit, slowing down? Then you realize they only counted half the year, okay? Uh, that was August of 2012, right? So um, it's still doubling every three to four years now. In fact, if you looked at these websites today, we're just a few short of two million samples publicly available. Some cancer, some biopsy, some researcher has run that study. Now, let me just tell you what that means. You can get lost to zettabytes and the billions and billions, right? Any researcher now who wants to start a cancer study, right? And let's say a researcher at UC South, they want to study prostate cancer. Well, they can go to these websites and start with data instead of starting with a pipette, right? Like, you could be the most molecular person in the world, but why don't you start on the computer and figure out what other people have done first, right? Actually, forget about our scientists, right? Any high school kid that needs to do a science fair project now, right? Let's say she needs to do a science fair project on breast cancer. She can go to these websites, search for breast cancer, and find and download 60,000 samples of breast cancer about as easily as she can find a song on iTunes, right? <laughs> Search, there they are. Click and you start to download them, right? 60,000 samples of breast cancer. Now, what's so magical about 60,000? Well, if you haven't figured it out, I mean, so they're human, mouse, rat models, dog models, whatever. What's so magical about 60,000 samples? That's more samples of breast cancer than any one breast cancer researcher will ever have in their lab, right? Because by definition, any one of those researchers has to eventually put their data into the database, right? So whoever figures out the database now, now has more data than anyone else in the world, right? It's kind of intuitive. And maybe it's not breast cancer, you want to do prostate cancer or whatever, diabetes. Chances are someone's already used these technologies in the past 10 years to study this. And all that data is just sitting there waiting for you because nobody goes to look at this. I'm telling you, compared to how much data there is, hardly anyone uses this data, okay? Because we've kind of been trained in this weird way that if something is free, and on the internet, it must be valueless, right? Because it's free, and on the internet, there must be no value there, right? You would think you have cute kitten videos, right, on YouTube. This is the most valuable data in the world. This is the raw data from top scientists just sitting there, right? That's the culture we're in for sharing. Now, the number I like, actually, is the one above there, 2445. Let's say 2400. 2400 research groups 
have already contributed data into this repository. Let me tell you what a ridiculous number that is, okay? 2,400 research, 2,400 labs. Let's pretend I'm a brand new researcher in breast cancer. I know nothing, I'm a newbie, okay? And I'm writing an NIH grant, and you're all in my study section. I propose to you that I'm gonna get 2,400 of the best breast cancer labs in the world to get their best characterized patients, to use their latest technologies to do all these measurements, and I propose to you I'm gonna get them all to give me that data for free, right? Now think about how ridiculous that is, right? If you were reviewing my grant, you would laugh me out of the room. How could a newbie researcher get 2,400 labs to give you any data for free? Yeah, here it is, right? Here it is. So when I think of public big data like this, I think of it as retroactive crowdsourcing, okay? I'm getting my friends on the internet tell me that's crowdsourcing. But I'm getting 2,400 people to help, and those 2,400 people are there to help you, and they don't even know they're helping you, right? Actually, 2,400 labs are there to help you, and you don't even know they're helping you, right? I don't know, 60,000 samples still aren't enough for you. Just wait another year or two, it'll be 100,000 samples, right? It's just growing like crazy, just sitting there. And again, I'm showing you the molecular database, but we have dbGaP with phenotypes and medical data. We have so many of these kinds of cohorts and data sets that are just public, framing MR studies publicly available. I mean, so many of these data sets are sitting there waiting for people to use them. Nobody's still using them. Now, if you, have, if you have any doubts, the high school kids can do it. Here's the high school kid that did it, okay? So it's a 17-year-old uh, named Brittany Wenger. She used to be a Sarasota. She's from Sarasota, Florida. She's a Duke undergrad now. And she won the top prize in the Google Science Fair competition that year when she was 17 because she came up with an artificial brain to diagnose breast cancer. So this is machine learning. She downloaded immunohistochemistry and PCR results, and she came up with a diagnostic herself. She won top prize. The following year, I guess she was bored. This is 2015 now. She did this for leukemia. So she, she's in the paper for that. And of course, what I mean is, is my high school kid can do this. Now, we all better be in this mode of learning how to download data and interpret and analyze that data, maybe before we start our experiments, just to see what you can get with other people's data right now. Because it's the best data in the world just sitting there. That's what high school kids are doing. Obviously, we're trying to use this kind of data for precision medicine. Obviously, President Obama's been talking about precision medicine now for a year, a year and a quarter. Governor Brown has been talking about it for more than uh, almost two, almost three years now. And so the idea is that, you know, if you think about why precision medicine, uh, uh, you know, look at the three. Time is right because sequencing the human genome, which generates data. Improved technologies for biomedical analysis, that's kind of data. And new tools for using large data sets, data. I mean, data, 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 basically. It's the time why we can start to think about studying populations prospectively, putting a lot of money into that, and figure out when people actually get disease, how do they get disease. But these are going to be a million people that are essentially healthy people moving forward here. So UCSF and the entire University of California has put in these grants. We have a whole bunch of grants that cover. It's a comp it's competitive space, though. I mean, we might get something, who knows? But it's uh, but we're really trying to get some of this funding. My first big grant to think about precision medicine, I mean, this is way back, uh, almost 11 years ago at Stanford now. My first big grant was to go get every disease studied by these chips. Just go get all of them, right? Diabetes, this cancer, that cancer, just go get every human disease studied by these microbes. And when I started at Stanford 11 years ago, I was so amazed. We have 25,000 samples publicly available. And now we're just shy of 2 million, right? That's the growth rate. And what I do is I collect these kinds of experiments where people study disease and healthy, disease and healthy in the same experiment, okay? I need them to have the cancer and normal, or diabetes and normal. I collect these kinds of experiments. And the idea is, I'm not showing you any gene symbols or anything, but the colors might represent more of a gene or less of a gene. And, uh, you know, we can create one of these signatures, subtracting one from the other to figure out what's unique, what's the difference between healthy and disease. So signatures have been around for almost uh, more than a decade here in this year. Now, the first thing we want to do with these signatures is to think about, you know, well, what, what, what can we do with these signatures? Our first idea was let's try to come up with diagnostics from these signatures, so diagnostics. So what's a diagnostic, right? That's how we diagnose people with a disease, or tell if someone has a disease. You get imaging diagnostics. I love blood tests, okay? In fact, I love serum protein blood tests, proteins that are in the blood, and if I can tell that the protein's there, maybe someone has a disease. I like those kind of blood tests. And I'm talking about really simple, simple, stupid, naive protein. Uh, there's a thing called ELISA's. ELISA's have been around for the 1970s, the very specific way to look for one protein and quantitate it. If you've ever had a sore throat and a fever, you know, they stick that Q-tip in the back of your throat, you know, maybe you've done it yourself. Uh, and somehow they put some drops and you can tell if you have strep or not, right? 
So that's an ELISA. That, that test works in a desert. You don't need a refrigerator, you don't need anything. I love ELISAs like that, mm -hmm. right? Now, just for the kind of aficionados for a second, so what we're talking about though, oh yeah, so let's get here. So, so this, this is a protein, it's a little bit dangerous to show biology in the morning here, but the mm -hmm. DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. I love these ELISAs because we can measure proteins, but these chips, all this public data is on the RNA, the blueprints for the proteins, because they're a lot easier to measure than the protein. So all we're trying to do is if the RNA is up, then we're going to chase the protein out. If that one is up, then you see an arrow, we're going to chase the protein out, and we're going to buy these ELISAs to make some tests out of them, right? Some simple tests. So we did this for cancer, we got that to work, and we got transplant rejection. I'm not going to have to spend any time talking about them. I'm going to talk about this disease, preeclampsia. So this is one we really want to address. We want to come up with a diagnostic for preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is when the blood pressure goes really high in a pregnant woman, and it, this is still husbands lose wives uh, around the country, around the world. Uh, billions of dollars, and this disease falls right in the cracks of medicine. So the obstetricians, I love them, but they say, well, the disease, the delivery is the cure, okay? Take the baby out, the mother's going to be fine in just 48 hours, okay? But then we pediatricians have to keep these tiny babies alive for months, okay? Because it's a struggle. I mean, they're tiny, you know, you know it takes a long time for them to make it out of the NICU. And there are four drugs in trials right now for preeclampsia, okay? The FDA might approve them someday. But there's still no good diagnostic for this, okay? We're still using what we used uh, like 100 years ago, like how much protein is in the urine, right? In today's obese America, that doesn't really work anymore, okay? We need a more specific kind of test. Uh, and so we started this process. So Linda Liu was a grad student on the project, Bruce did the protein work, Matt got involved later, and I'll show you why. We started to search, well, how much data can we get started with? Well, if you search for preterm birth or preeclampsia, 266 experiments already done, right? Here's someone who studied 299 humans, 249, 154, 143. How many more do you need to get started? All these people have done this work. Why don't we just start to use their data sets and put them all together? So we do a meta-analysis here, okay? And really, it's kind of really simple, stupid Venn diagram. What is everyone seeing up regular, in common? I don't trust any one of these experiments. I don't trust them at all. But I trust what I get in common, okay? kind of like wisdom of the crowd kind of thing, right? I don't, I don't trust this one or this one, but if they're all seeing the same thing upregulated, I'm gonna chase it down and make a test out of this, okay? Does that make sense, right? I don't trust anyone, but I trust what I get in common. Here's an example of one of the genes or one of the proteins we had to discover called hemopexin. And you can see it's higher in the pregnant uh, women with preeclampsia compared to pregnant women without preeclampsia, so the pink versus the green there. And this is early and later in the, in the pregnancy. Now, we got this test to work. We had March of Dimes money to get it started, and we had a Spark grant, it's like a catalyst award here. The CTSI gives you a seed grant to do this. And if it works, what do you do next? You start a company, right? I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed of that, right? You've got to start a company here. If you want to get to patients, this is what you got to do. So we started a company on this, right? We got it to work, we got Life Science Angels to seed it with $2 million. Now let me be crystal clear here. I'm not showing you $2 million here to brag about it, okay? I'm showing you $2 million because I'm convinced this is a new way science will continue out of academia. If you get something to work and you want it to get to patients, but you're not still sure if it's going to work in the real world, you're still going to be doing research, you're still going to be doing a study, but now I have it funded on private dollars, right? Because it's getting closer to the patients, there might actually be some money here. Let me put it this, a different way. Do you know how hard it is to get a brand new $2 million NIH grant, right? You know how hard that is, but the science continues for me now in the company. My lab goes in a little bit different direction, right? And the science continues in the company. That's the whole point here, right? Why it's compatible with academia. But this one I really love, because we've already sold this company. It already got bought, okay? Some of you know what that means in Silicon Valley, the Silicon company, right? So what happened here, so we have publicly available data, we designed the diagnostic, we got seed grants and March of Dimes to get the testing done, launched the company, and 24 months after this public data, after an analysis, just 24 months we had already sold the company. Progenity is a massive company in San Diego that has a whole sales force. They're further developing this, they're launching a multi-center clinical trial, prospective trial. Again, we don't know if it's gonna work or not, but the science is continuing the company now. That's the whole point. So we're gonna do a lot more of these. And I give away my secrets because there's so much unmet need in medicine. We're gonna do a bunch of these. So you're not gonna hear, again, I don't think it's taboo to talk about companies here. Right? As academics, we've we gotta have some responsibility here.
I switch gears to talk about drugs and pharmaceuticals for a second. The pharmaceutical world is even worse, right? So the, the rate limiting step to precision medicine is going to be our lack of having drugs. Okay, it's a fundamental thing. And what I mean is, if I might know that there's five kinds of breast cancer here, but I don't have anything different to do, right? I only have a certain number of drugs to use here. Our limitation is going to be how many therapeutics we have, whether it's in treating diabetes or hypertension or cancer, because it's costing too much to develop drugs, right? If I ask you how much does it cost to develop a drug, what's the answer most people give, you know? Billion dollars, 10 years, a lot of people know. Maybe they advertise on the Super Bowl, maybe you don't watch those commercials. <laughs> Even the pharma industry tells people it costs a billion dollars and 10 years to develop a drug, okay? Actually, a billion dollars is an underestimate, okay? How much does it actually cost to develop a drug? It's kind of simple math, you guys are math types, you can figure this out. How much did you, it's a simple formula, how much did you spend on making drugs divide by the number of drugs you got, right? It's kind of simple math. How much did you spend divide by the number of drugs? If you do that simple math, this comes out of Forbes uh, every other year or so, these companies are spending between $4 billion and $12 billion to develop a drug. Now, that is just not sustainable, okay? In the United States, that is not sustainable. It's getting worse because the costs are going up and they're still not coming up with drugs. And then you realize that whether you love the pharma industry or hate the pharma industry, there are not even enough pharma industries to develop all the drugs we still need in medicine for all the patients with all the cancers, all the different metabolic diseases we have. And then you realize it's gonna to have to come down to each one of us to solve this problem. The biotech industry, the pharma industry, I love them. You saw my first slide, I consult for them all. I love them, but they're not going to solve this problem. It's kind of like asking, you know, IBM to invent an iPhone, okay? The culture is totally wrong. It's just never going to happen. It's going to come down to each one of us, especially in academia, to solve this problem because there's just not enough of them out there to even address this problem. So I started to realize I'm going to have to become a drug developer. I'm a computation guy. I'm going to have to figure out how to make these kinds of drugs. And we start collecting these experiments. I already showed you we can collect disease and healthy on the left. And all right, we started to collect experiments from people, study drugs on cells, with the drug, without a drug, with the drug, without a drug. So on the left, I got with disease, without disease. And on the right, I got with a drug, without a drug. And they're even different cells. I'm just going to put these two together. The reporters for this called this Match.com for drugs, OK? Because we've got a pattern there, a pattern there. Let's put these two together, right? You know Match.com. And the famous saying, right, is opposites attract, right? You know, refer to that. So that's exactly what we do here. If I've got a disease where you know this this box this uh, this gene is going up and I got this one going down and I can find a, a drug that can make this one go down and this one go up, maybe there's a match there, right? Just naively looking for drugs that reverse what I'm seeing in the disease. It's kind of really simple and naive like that. So we turn our crank and we got lots of ideas. Here's a drug. There's a drug. And, you know, let's test them now. Uh, well, actually, the new drugs are really tough to pursue. Where we got a lot of traction is figuring out new uses for old drugs, okay? So the concept is called drug repositioning. Have you ever heard of drug repositioning? There's some famous examples of drug repositioning. There's this interesting cardiac drug that had a side effect of hair growth. That's minoxidil today. That is the minoxidil ointment that people use for baldness that started as a cardiac drug. But everyone knows the other cardiac drug that had its own weird side effect, which is today Viagra, right? That also started as an angina drug. Uh, fewer people realize Viagra has done a double switch. There's another drug called Rivatio, uh, which is specifically indicated for pediatric pulmonary hypertension. So blood vessels from the heart to the lungs in babies, they can be constricted. This opens them up too. People crack jokes about babies on Viagra and all of this, but you know that molecule has another use. But you know what, instead of finding these new uses by accident, how about we find them on purpose, right? Using public big data. So that's the whole concept here. That's what we're doing. Well, we turn our crank, we've got lots of ideas. Here's a drug and there's a drug. And we've got to test them in humans, but oh, we can't put them in humans yet. We can't run in clinical. So we've got to test them in animal models first, right? No one's going to ethically approve this. So we've got to test them in a mouse or a rat. And all my mouse friends on campus scatter, okay? Because they know, know, they know I'm going to give them a lot of work to do, okay? And I have, we have some good ones. We've got some great work out of them. But now, when I really need to run a mouse model with my computer prediction, I can find my friends, or I can go to assaydepot.com. Kind of sounds like Home Depot. Yeah, it does, right? These are my aisles. Would you like to go browsing in biology, chemistry, 
DMPK is drug metabolism pharmacokinetics. If you don't know what that stands for, don't click there. Pharmacology, toxicology. Let's click on pharmacology. We need to test some drugs. What type of mouse do you want to run today? Bone, cardiovascular, dermatology, diabetes, general ear, infectious disease, inflammation, neurology, cancer, eye, ear, pain, respiratory, right? Whichever one you want to test, just go click and order a mouse. Here, let's click on diabetes. Let's say I have a brand new diabetes drug. We've developed a couple in my lab. Here, I can order a 16 mouse study, okay? Maybe two groups of eight or four groups of four. I'm sending the, the drug that I'm testing in a blinded way so they don't know what I'm doing. And if you don't know what OBOB is, you can read the description. It says, this mouse has been eating a lot and getting diabetes since 1951. Okay, this is a standard model for American diabetes, right? You eat a lot, you get diabetes, kind of thing, right? It's not the best one, it's not the worst one, it's one everyone uses, okay? And in 28 days, this company will give you the fasting blood sugar, the insulin tolerance sets, the glucose on sets. You know, we do those in humans, we do those in the mice too. And they'll give you all the results in 28 days. Now, what am I covering up here is the price $9,000 for the service, nine-week turnaround time, and I'm not making this up, add to shopping cart, okay? You can order an entire mouse experiment now to test one of these drugs with a credit card off the internet today, okay? I'm not making this up. We do this like crazy in my lab, okay? So it's kind of just, I know you need a pretty hefty credit limit to pay for that, that's what angel investors are for, but add to shopping cart to order this study, okay? Now, what is this? These are called contract research organizations, CROs. They get involved with clinical trials. They're all, they've been doing mouse stuff forever. Pharma uses them all the time. What happened is SA Depot, Science Exchange, these clearinghouses, put them all together, make the price kind of transparent, the price has plummeted. So even we in academia can actually afford this. So now the wettest thing, we do a lot of wet lab experiments in my lab, but the wettest thing in my lab is the coffee machine, right? We don't touch any of these mice, we don't do any of this, because we just order it from experts to do these experiments. Okay, we literally, this is what we do. Some of you with really good eyes, sharp eyes, can notice this is being run in China, okay? Some of you may have a problem with that, others not, but let me just be really crystal clear. When you get out the shopping cart, they show you the 133 companies or labs willing to do this for a price, including Maryland and Wisconsin, okay? So outsourcing like this doesn't always mean offshoring. You can pick wherever you want in the world to do it. But some of you are really worried about the quality of this work. So there's certifications here. So if I need them to be USDA approved, click there, there's four. FDA, there's five. ISO 9001, there's seven. AAA, like 28. You click on those certifications, you're only going to see the companies that are certified to do it like that, right? Oh, how I wish it were that easy to find the right collaborator on campus, right? That I knew someone with certifications doing this experiment instead of some random undergrad, you know, or something. I mean, I can at least get certifications on this. But some of you are really, really worried here. Okay? Because you know, once I get this to work, I'm going into humans next, right? So you're really worried, how can I trust the quality of this work? And I'll just simply say, if I really, really need to test one of my computer predictions now like this, a drug in a mouse or mouse model, if I really need to know if this is working, I simply order two of them from two companies. Hell, at $9,000 each, I could order 10 of them from 10 companies, right? So why am I saying it like this? Think about a mouse researcher on a mouse campus, let's say, right? Okay? We have mouse researchers all over the place here. When a mouse researcher gets a mouse re uh, experiment to work, do they go across the hall to get a completely independent team of researchers to repeat their experiments? You know nobody does that, right? But I can hire now as many independent teams as I want to repeat my research here, right? So what I can now do is take that quality problem that everyone has in their minds when they hear my talk, this quality problem. How do you trust the quality? I can make it a function of dollars now, right? If I have more dollars, I can get more quality. I don't have enough dollars, maybe I can only get one or two of these teams to do this, right? And the quality problem evaporates. So I don't trust any one of those public experiments, but I trust what I get in common. I don't trust any one of these companies, but I trust what I get in common, mm -hmm. right? That's the way I'm going to be doing my science now, right? I don't have to set up a mouse lab in my thing in, in my lab because we're not going to be experts in that. Let's go hire experts to do this. So we did a bunch of these. And the one we're most famous for is actually predicting topiramate, a seizure drug, works on inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease. 
So we're going to run the front page of Wall Street Journal, a bunch of journals for that. These are my famous rat colonoscopy videos, okay? You know the size of a rat, you know the size of a colonoscope. Why would you ever learn how to do that in your lab, right? I mean, there's a company that actually knows how to do this experiment. This is what a normal rat colon looks like on the left. It's a rat with uh, the chemical called PTM. Yes, it makes that inflammatory bowel disease. It's all better with the seizure drug, topiramate here, right? Got 40 megs of video that came went with this paper. We got just tons of data. We've been doing a bunch of these now. The one I'm most proud of is this one, though, okay? So this one just came out about a year and a half or two years ago, that we predicted that the psychiatric drug, imipramine, it's a, anti, it's a tricyclic antidepressant for depression. We predicted it works on small cell lung cancer. So small cell lung cancer is a nasty cancer to have. Humans smoke to get it, 5% survival rate. This mouse, if you knock out these three genes, this mouse is mouse lung cancer, okay? You can see the kind of nodules there. It's not like a human cancer put into a mouse or anything. This mouse gets its own lung cancer, the nodules there. And this mouse is the same kind of mouse, you can see the lungs, treated with the drug imipramine. Now, what was wrong with imipramine? Well, we moved on to newer antidepressants. We have this thing called uh, Prozac, right? Serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Imipramine had some side effects. In some people, it made you really sleepy. And in others, it might set you up for what's called QT prolongation. It might set you up for an arrhythmia, okay, where part of the EKG gets wider. Actually, neither of those two side effects sound as bad as having lung cancer, 5% survival rate. And the cancer is melted away in the mouse. It's gone in this mouse. And we've done a dozen of these. Why am I showing you this one here, right? This one is really neat because we started with public data, right? We get a computer prediction. We test cell lines in a dish. I'm not even going to show you that. We get this amazing mouse result here. 15 months after the computer prediction, we got IRB approval. We launched a clinical trial on this. Patients are dosed on this drug in a trial. Total cost of this trial, 50,000 bucks. Not a million, not even a hundred. It was a, like a catalyst award, right? Seed grant, just to test this drug. We got to do more of these. We got, I don't know if it's going to work or not. I'm financially conflicted now. The trial's going to run without me. But we got to do a ton more of these because there is no pharmaceutical company developing a drug on small cell lung cancer right now. And we got to just do this ourselves in academia. And, oh yeah, uh, well, I'll skip you. You got to start a company on this, right? So we started a company called Numedi, more than $5 million raised, and we're developing drugs for Allergan and Aptalis and all these companies, because these companies are just not going to be able to do this. I fundamentally believe, I think we can do smaller teams in Silicon Valley can do the work of like thousands elsewhere because we use data, we use computers to do this kind of work. But it's not, it's not to get wealthy why I do the companies. This is, this is why I do the work, and I always keep the slide in there. So this is an email I got in October of 2013 as the paper was coming out. Hello, my name is, I'm a, I need help, I'm an Italian man, I live in Sweden, 48 years old, I have three children, six, eight, 17, all with the same wife. On June 5th, the doctor told me I have small cell lung cancer, neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, today I work 75%, I have different metastases, liver, kidney, pancreas, and skeletal. I know I will not live longer than a few months or over a year. My family is desperate, please, I'd like to try the new cure that you've studied, and now you will try with people. This is why we're doing the work, right? We have plenty of patients that show up every day to our hospitals, and we have nothing new to offer them. And we cannot keep waiting for the pharma and biotech industry to come up with these drugs. We need newer ways to do this, to make it done in a much more efficient way. I have one way to do it, but we all need to come up with ways to do this in academia, because we cannot just keep waiting for these industries to do it. I know they're making ridiculous amounts of money, but even despite that, they're still not coming up with the drugs we need here, right? This guy is already gone, okay? 2013, he, this is the email. He's not even around anymore. This is why we're in the business, why we're in academic medical centers, to do this kind of work. All right, so let's just close it out here. Are we doing for time? Okay, perfect. Couple of things, I'll just end with a couple of high points here, right? Where do I see things going next? You ask me what the next big open data is going to be, what half my lab is working on right now over in Mission Bay? Clinical trials data, okay? What's a clinical trial? The most expensive experiment in the world, right? Half of them fail, that's why it's costing us billions to make these drugs, by the way. Half of them fail, and when a clinical trial fails, we have this weird culture, we don't even write a paper about it, right? Forget about releasing the data, right? It's gonna change, I just see what's coming, okay? The EMEA, which is like the European FDA, 
All of a sudden, they're requiring raw clinical trials data release, okay? It's a whole thing, fight between uh, Roche with Tamiflu, British Medical Journal, if you've been following uh, along in the editorials in JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, a lot of calls to get this raw data release. I don't mean that summary table you got put on clinical trials like that, but I mean the raw data from your tables here, right? So I think the next big data is going to be clinical trials there. We're learning in my lab how to do meta-analyses across trials. With the, I mean, you're basically repeating what the trial people did, but maybe saving a drug, maybe doing comparative effectiveness across trials. That's the kind of work we're trying to do with trials data. On import, I run this for NIAID. It's a big part of NIH, the infectious disease, allergy folks at NIH. And we give out more than 100 raw clinical trials. In fact, we're the only ones that truly give out raw clinical trials data to the public right now. There are immunology trials, and there happen to be a lot of Genentech trials, but we're the only ones right now. Pharma set up their own kind of weird thing to try to head off what's, what's coming in. We've written papers that doesn't work. If you want to learn about trial data, we give out more than 100 on this website. You can sign up for an account, it's pretty free. But I think a lot is going that way. Right, let's get out of the molecular world for a second. How many of you have a wearable, have a watch? Uh, one, two, three. Okay, so usually it's Silicon Valley, it's about 10 to 20 percent. Here's a little less than that. Uh, this is a whole field of quantified self. You know, you measure everything about yourself, your step counting, your weight. You kind of measure everything that goes in and out of your body. Measuring things that go into your body sounds doable. Measuring things that go out of your body sounds gross. So I used to laugh at these people, right? I mean, Kind of crazy people until December of 2012. December 2012. Came back from a trip to Hawaii. I stepped on a scale. I was 247 pounds. And then I realized when I hit 250, they can measure me in tons, right? That's a quarter of a metric ton, right? <laughs> I was like, what the hell happened to me in Silicon Valley? I'm driving, driving everywhere, right? Bought everything Fitbit made. Lost 50 pounds, okay, in two years. And so I learned a lot about weight in the process, okay? The step counting is cute. I like it. I try to get 10,000 steps. Nothing beats the scale in the morning. I weigh myself every morning, so I know how to compensate that day for what I'm eating. I've written down everything I've eaten from now two and a half years, almost three years. It's a Hawthorne effect. You just start measuring it, it gets better, right? It's a Hawthorne effect. And I kind of use Weight Watchers rules. So if you bite it, you write it, okay? So everything gets written up this way. 50 pounds I've lost. Now, I love this. I'm not saying this as a weight loss thing. I mean, all my friends know I lost the weight because this is connected to Facebook and LinkedIn. I don't know why you tell LinkedIn people you lost weight. Uh, Facebook people can tell you lost weight, right? But here's the funny part. When I go to my doctor, and I'm kind of ashamed to say I still go to my doctors in Sutter, uh, like Palo Alto Medical Foundation, it's kind of like our competition, right? But they're close to where I live. So when I go to my doctor, and it's been written in the newspaper, they spent a billion dollars on Epic at Sutter, okay? It's in the newspaper. A billion dollars on Epic. The problem is that I lost all this weight, the best health intervention I'll probably ever make in my life, but my doctor was the last person to hear about this, right? Because their billion dollar system doesn't talk to my $40 gadget, right? It's gonna change. It's gonna change. And Silicon Valley is great at trying to empower the regular guy here, right? With these kind of devices and apps and smartphones. If we don't get with the program in medicine, we are going to legitimately get cut out of the loop. We're just not going to be part of a healthy population anymore because they're going to be electronic tools, giving them advice. All this is going to be there. And the longer we ignore this, the more we're just going to get really just written out of the picture. So I'm a big proponent of connecting with patients this way through the different devices and smartphones and stuff that we should do. It. We have a Center for Digital Health Innovation here at UCSF, which is doing great, but we've got to do more of that. Let's get this one. Another big data source is the cost data, charge data, which you probably know a little bit more about, right? It's cost data. It turns out all these different payments that Medicare, Medicaid makes, payments to physicians for consulting, sunshine, all that stuff is public now, okay? It's amazing. I was giving grand rounds at the University of Miami when this article literally showed up that morning in the Washington Post. So I used it to kind of poke fun at them. And what it shows is that the University of Miami, I was literally there, University of Miami charges double what Jackson Memorial does across the street, okay? You can just see heart attack, you can just see on the right there, they charge double. And I was poking fun at them, and you know what they said back to me? They said, that's okay, we can charge more because our quality is better. You can't say that when the quality data is public too, no, you can't say that, right? Because all that's public too, right? So the funny part here is that the reporters are getting this data faster than we are using this data. Right? How is the public going to respond? Nobody wants to be in the kind of edges, right, in the tail. You want to be in the middle. 
but the public and the reporters are all over this stuff. We have got to get a handle on what our own data looks like better than the reporters do, right? So it's another big source of data. And so much more. I have no time to talk about it. epidemiology, uh, molecular stuff, microbiomes, all this kind of data publicly available there, right? So in the last few minutes, I've talked about a couple things I'm most proud of. Uh, we get to run uh, precision medicine at UCSF now, so I'm really pleased to be working with uh, Governor Brown's office. We basically got $3 million, even Sacramento calls it budget dust, $3 million bucks to give it a pilot project. We have kids with cancer, with another uh, atrogenic disease thing that we're looking at. They're pro projecting $10 million this year, so we'll see what happens next. I mean, it has to get approved first, but hopefully, you know, maybe it's, precision medicine will be like a stem cell thing. We'll see, you know, whether that was billions or not. I don't know. But I get to run this for the state, so I'm really happy about that. And of course, I'm building this new Institute for Computational Health Sciences. Uh, we're slumming it out in this brand new building until they build our brand new building across the street uh, in Mission Bay. The UCSF is still not done building buildings, it turns out. So we're right going to be to where Illumina is, a sequencing company in the new hospital. So it's a great location for kind of a molecular team like us. And I love it. I get to recruit a dozen new faculty. We we'll have this building in 2019. I love all of that, but why did I actually move from Stanford? Okay, I love Stanford, right? UCSF moves a lot faster than Stanford. Everyone who thinks otherwise, talk to me. I'll tell you the real thing. <laughs> we move way more faster and way nimbler than Stanford does. But I really moved because of this thing called UC Health. Any of you heard of UC Health? Okay? So UC Health is the umbrella across all five University of California medical schools, right? So you have UCSF and UCLA, which are the big ones, Irvine, Davis, and San Diego. We also have Riverside, but they don't have a medical center yet. So I'm counting these five here, right? And so UC Health is the umbrella. So most people don't even still know that if one of the five approves an IRB, the other four essentially automatically approve it, okay? If any one of the five approves a contract like with Genentech or Google, all five essentially approve it, okay? It takes like days or weeks, not months or years for that to happen, okay? Because we have this kind of synergy. Now, I moved from Stanford uh, to UC Health because I now get to build the data warehouse across every patient in the UC system. And at last count, actually, it's 14.5 million patients get some care at the University of California. And I get to build the central data warehouse for all of it. Now, we've had something similar, something like this called Rex. Any of you heard of UC Rex? Nobody, because I don't know, nobody uses Rex, right? Anyone use Rex at all? Maybe? Yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah, I've heard about it. Nobody's used Rex. It's been kind of a disaster. It's been there for six years. And Rex has been this tool where you can sign up for an account, and if you're a faculty member, they'll let you do this. You can count how many patients are there in the UC system. So I'm looking for patients with this diabetes and this blood test and this, and all five show up. Okay, UC Irvine has 10 like this, and Davis has 14 like this. You can count the number of patients that meet certain criteria. But if you want any data on those patients, it takes you six to 12 months to get the data, which is why a lot of people maybe try Rex once and they never use it again because it's kind of useless, all right? Rex is great, but now what we're talking about is taking it from six months to six microseconds because we're going to have all the clinical data for every patient in one big database, centralized, mm -hmm. under a massive lock and key, security, privacy. It's sitting in the secure part of the San Diego Supercomputer Center. So this is like sitting in my cubicle, okay? It's like under lock and key with some of the best people in the world. And the idea here is to use this kind of data. What can we do with all that data in one place? Well, I have kind of 10 bullets here for the 10 campuses of UC. Clinical researchers could run genome-wide association sites with genetics. Mobile health researchers maybe could get patients to contribute their own data. Community activists could study environmental factors, maybe take the geocoded data with Cal EPA data. We'll have slices and dices of this with de-identification, you know, make sure that we can let it out to the public, at least different pieces of it, let it out to entrepreneurs. Maybe modeling Alzheimer's disease or app designers could make, you know, apps for patients to give them choices for chronic disease. Cancer genomics research is going to look at all the cancer patients in the UC system, and on and on and on. What I'm trying to do is to make maps, maps of death and disease. Now, that's kind of morbid, but, you know, what I'm talking about is like Google Maps of, like, how do Californians go from healthy to disease to death, okay? I'm trying to make maps. And so we can use this data. So kind of prototype work we've been doing with the death index and other hospital discharge data. But what we're doing is we're making maps. So Hannah in my lab does this, and I made so here's an example of a map that we learned. Here, patients come in with alcoholism, and then a year later, a bunch of them come in with cirrhosis. So 
Sum of dye of cirrhosis, that's what the squares mean, the depth of that, from that disease. But some of cirrhosis have liver abscesses, and then some die of that, okay? So sometimes patients go this way, or they can go this way, or they go this way. And each arrow here represents something that's happened in the next year, okay? So we're starting to predict now. If patients come in with this, they might end up with that a year later, right? They can get kind of complicated. Here's an example of patients that come with a heart attack. I know patients often die of a heart attack, and many end up with heart failure. That means the heart isn't pumping strong enough, right? Some die of that. But I did not know some of them come in with lung disease later, like because of fluid in the lungs, and a whole bunch of them die of sepsis, okay, which is in blood infection. So I, I know heart attack is a pretty lethal thing, but I didn't realize within three years, a bunch of patients actually don't die of the heart problem. They die of the infectious problem. So maybe we can start to look for sepsis, a little bit, be a little bit more suspicious in heart attack patients. Or they might go this way, right? Can you see the idea of maps here? Because once you have maps, then you kind of know what could happen next with your patients. What I'm trying to do now is to build a map of all of death and disease and health in California. And so when we open that new building in 2019, I'm going to have a big conference room there, and I'm going to have a wall of monitors, okay? A wall of monitors. I'm going to have my maps up there. Now, what's the difference between our maps and Google Maps? Well, I love Google Maps, but actually Google Maps doesn't show you the actual cars, right? They show you some traffic, but they, they don't show you where all the cars are. And in 2019, when I build my room with my maps of death and disease, I am going to have all 14 million patients on that map. So this is our prototype for this. These are real life patients. Each dot there represents 500 patients moving from disease to disease to disease. The age of the patients is getting older. As the color gets older, they get, they get older. You can see going to this disease and some died of that. This is with real life data. Okay, this is what we've already built from California data here. And we're going to now start to be able to predict what's going to happen next in the next 90 days for 14 million patients. What's going to happen in the next year for patients? And we're going to do something about it. What can we do in the next 90 days to make sure our patients are okay? And that, to me, is going to be the new definition of an accountable care organization, one that accounts for the care of the 14 million of its patients, not just when we're seeing them in encounters, but even between the encounters, right? Keep an eye on them with mobile devices and wearables and make sure our 14 and a half million patients are doing okay. I don't want to be big brother here. If they don't want to be part of this, they don't have to be a part of this. I think this is going to be the new way we are going to be an accountable care organization as the University of California. So I can't do any of this work. Uh, let's skip ahead here. Yeah, I can't do any of this work without a long list of collaborators. I want to make sure I highlight this slide here. I'm basically paying off 40 people across the University of California system to get this database built. And actually, this week it kind of got done. So I wanted it done before my first year anniversary. We have all those records in one computer system. Literally, we've got four out of the five use Epic, so we just did a dump of Epic. Uh, Irvine uses all scripts for some reason. They're moving to Epic, but we're just putting all that data in one place with a couple billion rows in a big table uh, sitting over at San Diego Superior. They're all harmonized because Rex people have already done so. We've already kind of already done it. This is a team of people across the system have done it. I've not color coded like which person's on which UC campus because we are all one campus, just different zip codes, okay? I want to show that we're all together, not separate here. And do any of this work well, along with the collaborators of the molecular world, the genetics world, the clinical world, a lot of Stanford, a bunch now starting up at UCSF. I have to thank UCSF for giving me endowment support. For the past two years, I've had 17 NIH grants from NIH. The four on the left give me more, the five on the right give me less, but I still love them. <laughs> Mark Shadon, JDRF, HP, HHMI, stem cell money, a lot of disease-specific foundations give us money to try to address their diseases with this kind of work. I always thank my admin and tech staff to never get a grant or paper after or without them. And Zach Varney at Boston Children's at Harvard Medical. He's been my friend and mentor for my life. Keith and Sam recruited me to UCSF. And I always thank my wife, Jeanette H. Pine. She's a great scientist, reads papers and grants that come out of my lab. She authors them with me once in a while, starts companies with me now, and lets me go all over the place to give talks like this. Thank you very much.